you very much. Can I be heard? Okay, excellent. Thanks very much for coming. So I want to talk to you about the, um, the quantum internet. Specifically, you've probably all heard about this satellite from China that was launched successfully very recently where they used uh, entanglement distribution over a few thousand kilometers to do quantum key distribution. And um, they did this and it was very successful. Uh, the question is what else can we do with that kind of technology? Does it stop at QKD or are there other things that we might be able to do as well? And I'm of the view that actually QKD isn't even the most exciting thing that you can do with entanglement distribution. So I want to share a few ideas with you specifically related to distributed quantum computing, which I think is a much more exciting uh, prospect. So basically what the satellite does is this. It, it has a spontaneous parametric down conversion source. It sends down polarization entangled photons to two points that are within line of sight of the satellite. Okay, so let's think about classical computer networks. Um, it's very common for people to take a large number of classical computers and network them together into a cluster to make a more powerful computer. And you can go to Amazon and license out a certain number of CPUs for a certain amount of time for a certain amount of money and it'll process things in series or in parallel. And so you get distributed computation. So imagine this scenario. Imagine there are two people, Alice and Bob, they both have a computer of a particular power. Uh, there are two ways that they could compute. One is that Alice uses her computer all the time and Bob uses his computer all the, all the time. The other prospect is that they network them into a cluster uh, to make a virtual computer that's more powerful and they uh, time share it. So they each agree to use it half the time. Is there any benefit in doing that? Well, obviously the answer is no. If you make a computer that's twice as powerful and use it for half the time, that's the same as using the computer that's half as powerful for all the time. So classically there's no difference here and the reason is just because things add up linearly. If you add one more CPU, you double the comp computational power. But with quantum computers, we don't have this linearity anymore. As you all know, with quantum computers, the computational power of a quantum computer can grow polynomially or even exponentially with the number of qubits that you have in the system. So I'm going to formalize this. We've got what I call a computational scaling function that relates the number of qubits in a quantum computer to the classical equivalent power. So this might be like the flops or the classical equivalent runtime of the computation. And for classical computers, this is approximately a linear function. For quantum computers, it's almost always super linear. And so what that means is that in general, uh, if we go back to our earlier model of Alice and Bob with two computers of the same size, in the quantum environment, it's always beneficial for them to conglomerate their resources and timeshare than it is for them to use their resources independently. So that's the key observation. So let's go into that a little bit further. I'm going to introduce this notion called the computational leverage, which is how much extra computational power do you get by doing this idea of contributing your resources to the network, making a big virtual computer, and then timesharing the resources between you. So I'm going to call tau i the time shared computational power, which is the joint computational power of the entire network, all the, compu all the corner computers combined into one, times whatever proportion of the qubits you own. So that's, that's an equitable way of sharing it. And I'm going to call the leverage the ratio of the computational power with timing, with time sharing, uh, with and without time sharing. And so this factor lambda effectively tells us how much computation we get for free by contributing our resources to the network and time sharing the resources. Now for classical computers, this function is always one. It makes no difference. But for quantum computers, it's always greater than one. And it doesn't matter how many qubits you contribute to the network, whether you're a small player with one qubit or a massive player with most of the qubits, it's always strictly greater than one. In other words, it's strictly in the interests of all nodes to always contribute to a global network and timeshare rather than use your computers independently. I want to talk about how we can do this physically. So you're all familiar with the circuit model for quantum computing. You have some input states, some gates, time goes from left to right, and then you measure the output state. A completely equivalent model that a few people have spoken about during the conference is the measurement-based model, where we prepare a graph state called a cluster state, where the vertices represent single qubits, and the edges represent the application of controlled phase gates, which are maximally entangling gates. And the idea is that you can prepare this cluster state and once you've prepared it, all you need to do is single qubit measurements in a particular order with particular choice of measurement bases and that will define the algorithm. So you prepare this universal substrate state and then using single qubit uh, uh, measurements in a particular well-defined basis, you can implement any algorithm you want. 
This particular model for quantum computing lends itself really well to uh, explaining distributed quantum computing because we can do things like this. Imagine that we have a whole bunch of hosts and each of them has a small cluster state. We'll make it a, a square cluster state. And they share some quantum channels between them. If that quantum channel facil facilitates a controlled phase gate, then in a patchwork style, we can join these smaller microclusters together to make one big virtual cluster state, which is much bigger. So that's, that's the obvious way of how you can go about distributed quantum computing using the measurement base model. Once we don't need any long range gates now, um, and all the measurement operations are completely local. So this is really very elegant. Now, I said that you could do this by facilitating a controlled Z gate along the quantum channel. Another way to do it is using uh, bell pairs. Bell pairs are actually locally equivalent to a two qubit cluster state. So these, uh, these Chinese qubits that are coming out of the sky, they are actually two qubit cluster states. So coming down from the satellite, we send one half of the bell pair here, one half of the bell pair here. They do local operations locally to bond uh, their half of the bell pair onto their locally held cluster state. And now we fuse the, the qubits that way. So we don't actually need to do long range gates. This entanglement distribution coming from the satellite combined with completely localized operations is sufficient to fuse together the smaller cluster states in a patchwork to make a much bigger one. Okay, so now we know that you can use the measurement based model to make a distributed computation. And we know from that really, really simple mathematical argument that it's always beneficial to do so. The obvious problem is security. If we think about the applications for which quantum computing is likely to be used in the near future, it's going to be involve intellectual property, trade secrets, user data for massive data processing, uh, potentially national security, all sorts of really important things that we don't want the whole world to know. But if we're outsourcing our computation to this global network, it's quite plausible that everybody will be able to figure out what all our data is. So that's obviously a very big concern. Can we overcome that? The answer is yes, you can, using a technique called homomorphic encryption, uh, which is closely related to something else called blind quantum computing. And the idea of homomorphic encryption is that Alice can process her data on someone else's computer and get the result back without anybody being able to read her data, even the server that's doing the computation. So you can actually have data executed on a foreign server without the person who's doing the processing having to decrypt the data first. That's called homomorphic encryption. So the, the pipeline looks like this. Alice has unencrypted data. She encrypts it, sends it to Bob who does the computation without first decrypting it, sends it back to Alice in encrypted form. She decrypts it and gets her unencrypted output state, yeah? What's the difference with blind? Yeah, uh, it's very, very minor. So with, uh, with homomorphic encryption, Alice has just the data, Bob, has the algorithm description and the computer. With blind quantum computing, Bob has a universal quantum computer. Alice is communicating a description of the algorithm and the data and wants to keep both secret. So it's actually a harder thing to do. So that, that's the only difference. But conceptually, it's basically achieving the same, the same ends. Yeah. Okay, so we've got a way now of Alice processing her data without anybody being able to read it intermittently, even the server in between. So I want to show you a way of doing this in linear optics that we came up with a few years back. So imagine that we've got a really simple linear optics quantum computer. We're going to encode our input state into single photon and vacuum states. Ignore all this nonsense for the time being. This is just a linear optics network, so beam splitters and phase shifters. And at the end, we do photo detection. So it's a really simple model for an optical computation. Um, how do we encrypt this so that the person who's implementing you can't read what psi in or psi out are? Well, the first thing we do is we do a substitution. So wherever, wherever there's a vacuum state, we're going to replace it with a single photon horizontally polarized state. And whenever there's a single photon state, we'll replace it with a vertically polarized state. Now, the key observation is that in linear optics, horizontal and vertical polarizations are orthogonal. They don't interfere with each other. So this effectively goes through and implements two computations, one on the zero subspace and one on the one subspace, but they don't interfere in any way. Now, to encrypt it, what we do is Alice is going to apply a random polarization rotation to all of her modes before she sends it to Bob. So we've done the substitution, then we randomly rotate every mode. 
at the output, we do the inverse random rotation. So it directly undoes what this, so R of K, where K is the key, that's the random polarization angle, and R of minus K, they just cancel out to the identity. So from Alice's point of view, it does absolutely nothing. But from Bob's point of view, what he observes now is this r completely randomized mixture of horizontally and ver vertically polarized photons. So if he were to try and intercept and measure those photons, he wouldn't know what polarization basis to measure in, and so he wouldn't know which ones were meant to be associated with zero and which ones were meant to be associated with one. And so that's the basis for this encryption. I'll point out this is not perfect encryption. It's not uh, perfectly information theoretically secure, but, um, but it's probably the simplest example of, of how you can go about doing this. Okay, so here's the procedure. Substitution, random polarization rotations, linear optics unitary, inverse rotations, photo detection, and then Alice gets the output state without anything. Okay, so now we know that distributed quantum computing is a good thing to do. We know how to do it, and we know how to make it secure. This leads to all sorts of interesting observations that go beyond physics, which is what I'd like to spend the rest of the talk uh, speculating about. So this is a very, very speculative section. I just want to get some ideas out there. You may disagree with me. First of all, these timeshares are effectively a derivative asset in, 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 in economic terms. We're not trading physical hardware. What we're trading is the right to use a certain number of qubits for a certain amount of time. So we can treat this as a tradable asset, and it's foreseeable that this will become a commodity, much like you can buy compute time on an Amazon computer these compute, ti compute times on a universal, uh, on, on, a, on a globalized quantum computer is probably going to become a tradable asset. That, in turn, leads to a basis for an interesting idea for a virtual currency. Because what are the features of a sound currency? There are two features. First, it can't be counterfeited. And secondly, it has to exhibit scarcity. Well, it does exhibit scarcity. You can't fake a quantum computation. You've either implemented it or you haven't. And it can't be counterfeited. If you want to build more quantum computations, you have to build more quantum computers. So it exhibits the two key features that you would like from some sort of sound currency. Uh, what's attractive about this way of doing a, a currency as opposed to some others? Well, firstly, it incentivizes cooperation because this currency appreciates as more people join the currency union. There are lots of uh, pressures internationally, the breakdown of the euro, this kind of thing. This is a very unique currency in the sense that the more that we encourage people to join our currency union, the more, the more powerful the, the union becomes. And so it disincentivizes excluding others and incentivizes everybody uh, uh, joining in. So it's a technological force for peace and cooperation, at least economically. There are also big geopolitical implications. Uh, because now we're in a situation where I can rent out compute time to use on someone else's computer and potentially use it against them, because I can do homomorphic encryption, they wouldn't even know. So here's, here's, what, here's what might happen. Uh, a, a, a Russian bedroom hacker who has very limited resources will outsource Shaw's factoring algorithm to United States servers, use the computation to hack United States financial systems. The Americans won't even know, and then uh, he'll get the results back. It's a very adversarial thing to do. Obviously. Uh, the president has something to say about this. The fake news thinks the Russians are using our quantum internet, the best quantum internet, against us. I would never allow this. Sad. Look at this. It's ridiculous. 50,000 likes, 16,000 retweets. I don't know how he does it. Okay, so what's the outcome of that observation? The outcome of that observation is that there would be fracturing of the network. It would be a scenario in which, although it's in everybody's computational interest to bring as many people in as possible, by doing so, we're also strengthening them, and they could use that against us. Now, if we go all the way back to our mathematics from earlier on, where I introduced these leverage functions, the key observation there is that the fewer qubits you contribute to the network, the higher your leverage is. So that's not to say that the fewer qubits you have, the more computational power you have, but the fewer qubits you have, the more computational power you get for free. So if the United States allows our Russian bedroom hacker to join the network, proportionately, the Russian bedroom hacker is getting a lot more for free than the Americans do. The Americans are huge, they don't gain very much. Russian bedroom hacker is tiny, he gains an enormous amount. And so this in turn leads to a huge power asymmetry, which in turn could be used uh, for diplomatic pressure internationally. If we have this globalized network, it's foreseeable that the powerful players might say to some weaker party, hey Tanzania, 
uh, you know, do this for us or else we're going to exclude you from the network. If they were to exclude them from the network, it wouldn't do much to the United States because they own most of the qubits, but it would absolutely decimate the computational power of Tanzania. And so there are all sorts of power asymmetries that would arise from this kind of globalized time-shared model. It also has, this, has implications for fiscal policy. If we think about taxation, what does tax do? Tax disincentivizes things. If you tax uh, goods and services, people buy less stuff. If you tax capital gains, people invest less. If you tax qubits, people will buy, buy and build fewer qubits. So we can define a leverage function similar to before, the, the, the tax multiplier, which is the ratio of the computational power of, um, of, a, of the network without and with taxation. Uh, so if we imagine that you, you have a certain baseline number of qubits without taxation, if you introduce a taxation rate gamma, it would reduce the number of qubits to, to, a, to, a, to a reduced value. If we plug that into this formula and then do a plot, we get an exponential curve. So what this means is that unlike a classical scenario where this would be a linear trade-off, we have a scenario whereby Taxing qubits is extremely bad for the total computational power of the network, and subsidizing it is extremely good. So we're going to have to think very carefully about tax policies. It may be in our interests to heavily tax conventional assets like cars and bits and use the proceeds to subsidize qubits. Because if we transfer capital from bits to qubits, we're getting an exponential increase in our leverage. Okay, so those are my observations. I want to finish off by talking about where I think this whole thing is going to go with these quantum satellites. The ob obvious limitation is line of sight. We can only communicate, do our QKD or our entanglement distribution between two points on Earth which are simultaneously within line of sight of the satellite. If we want to get from my house over to Brazil, there's no line of sight uh, whatsoever. The, the, the satellites are going to have to form a constellation to relay the entanglement around, around the world. That suddenly complicates things enormously because previously these satellites were completely passive. They just make a bell pair and go chunk, chunk, and it's done. That's all they had to do. If we're going to have to start relaying around the world, then every second satellite is going to have to do a bell pair projection to entanglement swap the entanglement around the globe. So this guy here might make a bell pair. This guy here might make a bell pair. This guy here will do a Bell measurement, which swaps the entanglement between these two satellites. And now we've got a link from here to here, and then we can complete it going around the world. That might sound like a minor difference. It's actually very, very hard. Because to do the Bell projections, our two photons that are coming in, first of all, we have to have space-to-space -space links, not just space-to-ground links. So now we've got two types of links. Uh, if they're going to make a, a, a lattice configuration, the, the lowest order lattice is a honeycomb lattice, so you're going to need at least three input-output port satellite, uh, uh, telescopes on the satellite to connect to neighboring uh, space links. Um, uh, but, but most importantly, they need to be temporally synchronized at the beam splitter that does the bell pair projection. And what this means is we're going to need quantum memories on our satellites. And nobody really has reliable quantum memories for single photons at the moment. They just no, Nobody's demonstrated these. Lots of people have done work on atomic ensembles and long-lived uh, energy levels, all sorts of things, but nobody really has uh, really, really uh, reliable uh, quantum memories. But that's what we're going to need because the time of travel from here to here is never, ever going to be exactly the same as from here to here. Uh, and it's going to be, these things are moving at 25,000 kilometers an hour, so it's a very hard temporal synchronization problem. So in conclusion, I think the uh, quantum internet of the future is very exciting. I think that people are understating the implications when they just talk about QKD. I think it goes a lot further than that. The implications are immense. It's not just computational, but political, social, and economic. And we're only at the beginning of it. Now, these first-generation satellites, the one that was just demonstrated by the Chinese, these are really just a proof of principle that you can overcome the problem of getting single photons through the full thickness of the atmosphere and track things moving at high speeds in low Earth orbit. But the next generation of satellites are going to be, have to be far more capable, even though, even though what they're doing technically is a, is, is a fairly minor modification. They're going to need multiple space-to-space -space links. They're going to need onboard quantum memories and so on. So actually, we've got a long way to go. We're only at the beginning of the curve, uh, but I think the future of it is very, very exciting. So thank you very much. Um, this is, uh, well, I'll just keep my opinions to myself. Um, 
if you're interested in doing a PhD in Sydney, uh, please come and see me. We've got some positions opening up to commence at the beginning of next year. And I have to mandatorily advertise two conferences that we're organising. One is TQC, held in July in Sydney. The other one is the workshop on quantum simulation and quantum walks uh, in Perth in December. Uh, if you don't know, Perth is technically the most isolated capital city in the world in the sense that of all the capital cities in the world, this is the one where you have to travel furthest, about two or three hour flight, to get to another capital city. So you may fall into a state of depression, but it is actually a very nice city. Thank you very much.